Hallo. Hoor jullie mij? Ja, alles duidelijk. Um, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This evening will be in English. Um, welcome to AZ Night, number 11, themed hybrid landscapes, um, natural and artificial practices. My name is Ronald Kleis. Uh, I will be your host for the evening. Um, tonight, we have invited four unique speakers who each will give more, explain a little bit more on their theoretical work and also their artistic practices. Um, during this whole evening, we are joined by an illustrator, Wiede, on the right-hand side. Uh, Wiede will make drawings, sort of side notes to the talks of the evening, uh, and will sometimes explain what he drew, <laughs> if it's not self-explanatory. Ever since mankind has gazed upon the landscape of Earth, we have created this sort of uh, old image, this archetype, this uh, primal image. Um, in this image, we chose protagonists. Uh, we chose forests, we chose mountains, lakes, sometimes people. And all these different subjects made us wonder, they made us feel, they made us dream, and they made us contemplate on this landscape. But today, in our modern age, these things are changing. More and more are we being exposed to digital tools, to artificial tools, to natural tools, but also unnatural tools. How do we connect with these landscapes, is this question. How do we know what is real and what is not real? How do we go back and how do we truly experience that is in real life or that is virtually or digitally, natural or artificial? Are we losing the feeling to be in nature? Uh, we are more and more in city environments. How do we truly experience this landscape? How do we choose our way of interacting? And how do we change the landscape by doing so? I would like to ask you a few questions. Don't worry, the only thing you'll have to do is raise your hand or lower your hand whenever you agree or disagree. First question is, who has seen a landscape today? Please raise your hand. It's quite a lot, huh? especially here in Limburg, beautiful region. Who likes to take a moment to look at the landscape? Hmm, even more. Then who likes to take pictures and photos of these landscapes? Okay, 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 okay. Who rewatches these photos afterwards? Little bit less, a <laughs> huh? little bit less. Our digital archive is bigger than we admit. For the next series of questions, I want to go a little bit deeper. Huh? We have the sound in the background. I would like to ask to close your eyes. I want, to, I want you to think, uh, remember, see a certain landscape. Maybe it's from this wonderful holiday, or maybe it's just a landscape from your hometown. Take your time. Imagine the details. Now keep your eyes closed. Who is seeing trees? Please raise your hand. That's about half of you. Who is mountaineering? Oh wow, adventurous. Who has the urge to go deeper and to explore their landscape? Hmm. Also, one third maybe. Who is actually seeing a landscape that is on a different continent? Oh, very interesting. Can you smell your landscape? Can you, can you touch it? Is there something around you that has something you can feel, something you can grab? Please try to imagine this thing. Thank you. You may open your eyes again. We all know so many landscapes. We've seen a lot of different landscapes. But more and more, we are in getting in contact with digital landscapes. I, for example, 
I have no idea how it feels to be in Yosemite Park, but I do have an apple and I know how the half dome rocklets. Yeah. I think most people of you also know how Tuscany looks, if you ever had a Windows XP background. You know, the green, beautiful, surreal plains, the blue sky. Our collective memory of landscapes is being formed and shaped by these different ideas, these different images, sometimes from in real life, sometimes virtually or digitally. Do we need to be somewhere in order to truly experience it, is the question. Do we need to be able to touch it, smell it, or engage with it? For our first guest of the evening, he is a postdoctoral fellow in architectural theory at the Faculty of Architecture and Arts at the University of Hasselt. He previously studied art philosophy at the University of Leuven and defended his thesis on modern art historiography. His talk will introduce you to the subject of landscapes in fine art. Please welcome Vlad Ionescu. Hi, if you haven't been hypnotized yet, I will uh, try to introduce you to a few very simple theoretical questions. Just a, a, a small detail. Uh, uh, I, I do am affiliated to the Faculty of Architecture, but since this year I'm a lecturer at the Pexel Math School, so uh, I'm welcome to my students that are here. Thank you very much. Very generous of you to be here tonight. Um, oh, no way. Uh, um, okay, um, maybe we should start with uh, truism, so very simple truth, and namely the fact that the uh, landscape is none of the it was one of the oldest iconographic motifs uh, traceable throughout the entire history of art. There is no culture uh, that does not um, integrate nature in its imagery. Um, that is why. My first uh, image that I wanted to present to you, but it isn't, it's right here, yes. My first image is a Dutch postcard with colorful tulip fields, not only because Anne, I knew she works a lot on, 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 on this one of her uh, hobby horses, let's say like this, but it's also because uh, it's close to us. It is an image that transmits a feeling uh, of me a memory of a place through a landscape. Landscape art is interesting not just because um, uh, it shows uh, fragments of nature, but because it testifies of how people uh, relate to nature. Uh, however, tonight is not the time to provide an art historical uh, overview of landscape art. It would take um, an entire semester at least. So I shall, I, lim I shall limit myself to two points. First of all, the experience of landscapes traditionally as a fact, as emotion, and um, also as a concept in contemporary art. That's one point. Second point, the landscape as a figure of our interaction with the world. It's a completely different way of looking at landscape, not so much as an object out there, whatever that it can mean, but as a, a figure of thought, a way of interacting with the world, um, uh, as, uh, as a way of inhabiting, uh, encountering and dealing with the world. It sounds a bit abstract, but I will explain it and make it very, very simple. Um, as it is well known, a landscape painting um, uh, precedes the Western canon since it uh, had uh, received beautiful, already had received beautiful configurations in um, Chinese and Japanese painting. Um, not long ago, uh, this theme has been uh, recuperated in, in French thought by uh, someone like François Julien, a French uh, philosopher, who compared the Western and the Eastern conception of, land of landscapes. That is, um, he distinguished there between uh, the Western and the Western, uh, the, the Western and the Eastern way of looking at landscapes, um, and he distinguished the essentialist and fragmentary way of looking at nature in the West, uh, where the notion of landscape, as the name says it in different languages, landschaft, um, uh, a paysage, uh, denotes a partition, a partition, a fragment of nature, cutting it, cutting it up from a broader whole. As he argues in his um, uh, wonderful book, otherwise, Vivre de Paysage, Living of uh, the Landscape, Western uh, man subordinates landscape to the autonomous scrutiny of an investigative gaze. Western way of looking at the landscape is in, by investigating it, um, 
trade into understanding, cutting it up and understanding. Contrary to, the, to this kind of uh, Western attitude, the Chinese conceived landscape in a completely different way. And that's always typical of Julien. He always tries to, to, to say that they have a completely different worldview. The Chinese conceived the landscape as a set of polarities. So instead of saying landscapes, the Chinese refer to, for instance, mountains, waters. Eh? So they combine uh, an immobile and a mobile form, mountains, immobile, waters, mobile. Whereas the relation between the part and the whole constitutes the Western logic, matching different elements characterizes Eastern thought. Uh, the landscape is thus a correlation between space and effect. And that's why they call, they don't really have a word for landscape, but they, they say, for instance, wind light is a landscape, including two elements that infiltrate all solid framework. So landscape becomes a threshold, an interval, um, um, uh, a, a pair of, of words, basically. And in Chinese art, as we can see here, Ni Tan's landscape illustrates this kind of harmony. Uh, Julian describes them as a serene composition of hills and foliages of trees, shores, rocks, and, and uh, immersed in a, in a diluted uh, atmosphere. Now, I do not agree completely with his analysis because uh, the Western landscape um, um, uh, is also um, uh, relate, is characterized by this push of the gaze towards the deep horizon. Uh, that is, is something typical for the, the Western uh, uh, way of representing nature. They push the, uh, the gaze towards a depth background. Whereas in Chinese art, uh, uh, proximity and distance are homogeneous, are close to each other. Nevertheless, I don't think Julien does um, uh, justice to our entire European tradition, because there is, um, um, in this tradition, there are uh, instances where landscapes um, are uh, represented as a, uh, a sentiment and atmospheric fusion. I refer to the word, to the notion uh, that is quite well known in the aesthetics, that of the mood in English is, is called the mood. Um, in German it's Stimmung, in Dutch it's very simple, it's stemming. Um, um, the notion of the mood um, introduced by the Austrian art historian Alois Riegel, who defined mood uh, as a sentiment of harmony and rest that overcomes chaos, dissonance and movement. It is the effective response to this uh, visual contemplation of a peaceful landscape. That's what you feel when you feel the mood, huh? viewed from a distance. Huh? Uh, again, uh, mood originates in the awareness that uh, nature harmoniously um, uh, abides, accepts this law of, caus of causality. We are just part of a, of a larger whole and, and this is felt as, as, uh, as, a, as a restful uh, emotion. And the essay uh, where Eagle mentions this begins with uh, this image uh, of uh, standing on the peak of the Alps, the earth sinking underneath his feet, nothing is graspable and only the eyes can, can, get, can gaze into the distance. Hmm? All the oppositions uh, that the sense uh, bring uh, about disappear and the only thing that is felt is this Weltseele, this world soul that permits all things and unites them in a perfect harmony. Uh, the distant view presents us with, thus with this kind of unifying tranquility uh, that harmonizes all visual elements. Um, and it is felt, again, very important uh, in our tradition from, uh, as, as coming from a distant. Um, the viewer is thus embedded in a, a larger and indeter uh, indeterminate whole where all activities uh, or all action is postponed. Now, Landscapes are, landscapes are interesting artistic uh, motifs because they encourage us to adapt our perception to uh, space, to the extending, extending space. The foreground is, if we look at um, a few very, very canonical examples that everybody knows, the foreground is subordinated to the horizon. Yeah? Uh, and dramatic events are kept to a minimum. Why? So that the viewer can appreciate um, in the words of the poet Rilke, the great repose of things, yeah? the große Ruhe der Dinge. The relationship between background and foreground is thus vital when it comes to uh, landscapes. Um, it's vital in the way artists and, and artisans especially work with landscapes, because with, in painting it's, uh, the situation is very well known, it has been very well uh, received and, and discussed, but when it comes to artisans, to applied arts in a way, it's more difficult. Um, representing a landscape has often entailed rendering a distant horizon, right? Uh, there is no landscape in the other way uh, of a complete uh, nearness, right? 
But when it comes to, for instance, jewelry, and I was thinking about uh, your work, Patricia, this morning, when it comes to jewelry, a brooch or a pendant, um, the question is whether the body of the viewer can become a background. Uh, uh, isn't there an option to employ the body of the wearer as a background and then treat a brooch as a, as a foreground or deal with this kind of dialectic? Um, we can debate this a lot, and I hope we do, but it has already been discussed in a sense already by, by Riegel in, in 1901 when he explained that uh, late Roman, early Byzantine art, uh, on the basis of the gleaming background of, of brooches and, 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 and buckles um, uh, in this uh, Byzantine tradition. Moving uh, beyond painting, um, um, this, this uh, Austrian art historian Riegel also extended this uh, contemplative and disinterested experience of the mood to a genuine and original ecological understanding of landscapes. The context is again, is a long essay and a very well-known essay on the preservation of historical monuments. In 1905, written in 1905, right at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, where he first mentions the, the, this idea of an unconditional preservation of nature. So preservation of nature without any single interest. In this context, landscapes, uh, landscape paintings are addressed as a genre that uh, integrate the, the modern idea of monuments into, um, into nature, so that nature can be viewed as a monument. And Riegel plays a lot with this idea. Can we look at, at nature as a, as a monument in 1905? And he questioned in this in this essay, the, the, uh, I, I use his words, the, nationalist, uh, the nationalistic reasons for the protection of monuments, and argued that monuments present modern man with a sentiment of time's uh, passage, of natural growth and decay. Uh, they integrate, they are an opportunity to integrate our own existence into something larger, uh, uh, the natural growth and decay. He explains monuments along the axis, along the line, uh, along the difference between egoism and altruism. While historical monuments, he says, are preserved because they testify to a nation's past. Yeah? We preserve a, 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 a citadel because some, some king fought there. Um, so while uh, uh, national monuments are, uh, uh, historical monuments are preserved because they testify of nations past, the, uh, and, it's, and it's nationalist egoism, he calls it national egoismus, the modern protection of nature relies on complete um, uh, altruism, a complete disinterested care. Uh, with natural monuments, humanity shows its ability to overcome its, its egoism and its egoistic exploitation of nature and the cultivation of global altruism. And he argues that one can value a tree because it was planted, for instance, by a king or a politician, but um, an old forest or a gigantic rock cliff uh, are works of nature that exist independently of humanity. Uh, they, they have been there and will be there after you. And still he stands, we feel bad when this rock cliff is blown up in order to make a road or a forest is cut. We protect them as testimonies or testimonies of the past, um, existence, life and creation, uh, independently of any national interest as pure altruism. That is a different, um, let's say, modern uh, interlude um, about how this, um, o o regarding an alternative uh, look into, um, into, into landscapes as, as, a, as an ecological domain uh, for its own value. Now, if we uh, look at contemporary arts and look at, at the, uh, the relation of uh, landscapes to, uh, to not so much to affect, uh, to emotion, but to concept, um, some recent uh, artistic experiments have addressed nature no longer as separate um, sceneries, uh, but as the object of global marketing and legislation. Instead of uh, the framed landscape uh, that we can see uh, from Bruegel uh, up to Turner and beyond, um, instead of the framed landscape that bestows, bestows an effect, nature appears um, as a commodity. I will focus here only on two projects, uh, Ami Balkin's Public Smog and uh, Black Sh uh, Shoals uh, Stock Market Planetarium, a, a project by Lisa Autogena and, and Joshua, Joshua Portway. Uh, first of all, Ami Balkin, um, uh, Public Smoke, Earth's Atmosphere as UNESCO World Heritage Preserve, a project from 2012, is part of a larger project of her work entitled Public Smoke, started in 2004 and still going on. 
What does it? What what is this? Uh, well, it started with Army Balkans trade with emission offsets that can be bought and sold. The public park um, that she talks uh, that she uh, addresses is um, on the spot where emission offsets were acquired and used. And as you can, as you know, um, uh, uh, emission offsets uh, are a marketing a, a, a marketing uh, uh, asset. You can buy and sell them anytime you want. Public Smog is both a website, a public park, and a series of framed letters um, that you have seen in the previous slide that register the communication with different governments that were asked to include the Earth's atmosphere along other uh, world heritage sites. So basically to recognize the world atmosphere as a heritage site, and in that case, if that is possible, then of course we will have a clean planet because you cannot touch a heritage site. You can buy and sell emission offsets as much as you want, but you cannot really, uh, I mean, it is very, very difficult to, to change an, um, a, a site, um, a heritage site. So um, she wrote all these letters, and if, so here are a few. Um, um, uh, she framed all these negative re uh, responses that she got from uh, all governments of the world. Um, and she included in Documenta uh, 12 there, uh, she included postcards in the exhibition that visitors could send to UNESCO and plead for this initiative. Of course, it is a very conceptual way of uh, dealing with, with, uh, with landscapes. Uh, the marketing of nature is also the motif of this uh, work by Lisa Autogena and Joshua Portway, Black Shoals Stock Market Planetarium in, from 2001. The installation consists of uh, the interior of a dome, as you can see here in, in the image, a planetarium that contains the shifts in real time of companies listed on the market. It is a global landscape. The viewer can sit on bean bags, as you can see a few people there in the background, uh, underneath the dome and, and gaze at this artificial landscape that varies depending on which stock market the installation is connected to. The installation includes references to the Black Scholes formula, which is a very well known formula in economics, a model used to calculate both stock prices uh, and natural catastrophes. So that has already also been included in our uh, dealing with nature uh, and landscapes. Uh, the machine, there are uh, marketing machines that allow corporations to, uh, based on this uh, Black Scholes formula, to efficiently invest uh, while including ecological catastrophes in the investment mechanism. So the ecological catastrophe is already part of the uh, of the uh, of the investment in a certain sense landscape art um, this is uh, the part about uh, the, the conceptual side of dealing with, with landscapes in contemporary art but in a certain sense landscape art has always conveyed the sense of a distant fragment that is brought closer to the viewer that is something that it, it's, a, it's a general idea uh, in, in the history. If you look at Bruegel's uh, representation of the Alps, uh, um, brought uh, those distant places closer to a broader uh, to, a, to, a, to a broader public here in the north. Uh, the dioramas of Daguerre, here that you can see in the image, the, dior, the, the famous 19th century uh, dioramas of uh, Louis Daguerre immersed the Parisian public into the illusion of fascinating landscapes, of fascinating uh, uh, sceneries. Precisely because our entire planet can become a landscape, it proves that the notion entails the contemplation of a fragment of nature that is related to a larger whole. And that doesn't need to uh, be a question of a, of a small, a small uh, fraction of it. It can be the entire planet. But one classical, the, so the one uh, generic idea about landscape is always this relation of a contemplation of a fragment necessarily within a larger whole. Think about the, Austro uh, the Apollo 8 astronaut, um, Anders, William Anders, who evokes the appearance of the Earth in space. This was the ultimate uh, let's say landscape of the 20th century. Of the 20th century, um, he evokes the appearance of the Earth in space on the Apollo 8 as a complete surprise to the members of the crew. They were there in space. It was the first time they could look at at, at Earth from this from this from this uh, perspective. And Anders recalls that the possibility of seeing the planet as an object in space, yeah, so it was a fragment in a way within a larger whole, uh, was not discussed on the ground. Nobody prepared them, the whole entire mission, nobody told them about this image, that they will see this. And no one knew what to do except for panicking and rushing to find the camera 
and uh, immortalized the moment on Christmas Eve 1968, 24th of uh, December 1968. This was the ultimate landscape uh, that made the cover of Life magazine, a vision that was close, um, uh, close enough, even though it was, of course, millions of miles away from Earth. Um, incomparable, however, to the Voyager 1 mission, where the Earth appears as a minuscule white dot uh, uh, in, a, in, a larger, uh, in a larger landscape. Um, this is, again, just to prove that that kind of a distance within a, um, a, a view of a fragment within a whole is very uh, a generic idea concerning uh, landscapes. Um, a more humanitarian, humanistic, I would say, a more humanistic vision um, uh, on landscapes we, uh, we see in the work of Jim Mott, painter, uh, um, uh, an American painter, Jim Mott, who initiated in 2000 the itinerant artistic project, I, uh, IAP, uh, the itinerant artistic project, where the Jim Mott, the traveler, he, he travels throughout the United States of America and stays with hosts for whom he paints a small landscape painting as a gift for the accommodation, just like this one he holds in his hand. The project, uh, he has all of them on his website and you can, you can visit, you can see all of them. But, um, the project cultivates this kind of human bond um, uh, by returning to uh, this type of gift economy, inspired pretty much by uh, Hyde's uh, classic book, the, the Gift. In the work of Ami Balkin, uh, Lisa Autogena and, and, and company, the partitioning of landscapes has a political undertone. Uh, the fragmentation of nature implies its rational exploitation under capitalist market condition. There is no contemplation involved, just a, a portioning of nature um, and the division of nature into clean and dirty, used and not yet used. In this conceptual approach, landscapes um, are no longer a distance that is brought closer but a diagram, a horizon that surrounds us from all sides, an all-enveloping background that we all share, that we all should be aware of because, um, as, as, and we should all be aware of it because, as uh, uh, Rilke mentions in his wonderful poem on the melody of things, it brings us together as, as a humanity. Uh, understanding this background is all, only chance, understanding this landscape that is a, 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 a global uh, background is our own chance to, to, sur to survive on this planet. Landscape is this background that allows us to realize that on Earth we are more than the sum of total individuals. We are re always related to something uh, larger. Contemplation is uh, the attitude that landscapes mediate because the expansion of nature uh, outside ourselves from a field uh, to the earth seen from the Voyager 1 mission echoes the way in which thinking itself works. And that is my uh, final uh, reflection. Maybe landscapes are not only about things outside of us, but also about uh, the way in which thinking itself works, our own thinking works. Think about it. Contemplation um, uh, comes from contemplar, uh, which means being with a part of the sky. Con, with. Templar uh, means part of the sky, which the ancient uh, soothsayers, as you know, the ancient soothsayers, the Roman soothsayers, could cut up um, uh, and, and read the future in it. Uh, that's how they do it. But they frame the part of the, of the sky and read the future in it. Contemplate. Um, uh, understanding and imagining is thus a figure of, of the landscapes and, and, of, uh, um, and of our own mind. It presupposes that we have to take distance in order to orient ourselves in a world that has been and will be there uh, uh, without us. And I stole this idea basically from my favorite, uh, my, my, my favorite modern writer, which is Fernando Pessoa. Um, and he gave me this brilliant idea, um, uh, and I, I will just quote him. Quite independently of me, the grass grows, the rain waters the grass as it grows, the sun turns to gold, the whole field of grass that has grown and will grow. Very nice translation, lots of alliterations. Uh, the, mo the mountains have been there since ancient times, and the wind that blows sounds just as it did to Homer. And that's... The, the, the important po point. It would be more correct to say that the state of mind is a landscape that would have the advantage of containing not the lie of a theory, but the truth of a metaphor." End quote. So, uh, to sum up, landscapes are not 
states of mind, of course. They are out there. Uh, but um, our thinking metaphorically contains the landscape's external dimension. And as Riegel and Rilke argued, the consolation that we are part of a larger existence. That is why landscapes are so vital to fine arts. They regulate our relation to the world that exists um, not because, but despite of us. All, all powerful artistic images contain something of a landscape if and when they help us realize that the contemplation of a distance is essential to the human mind, essential and more appropriate than the lie that the entire world is at the top of our fingers when touching a digital screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you, have Vlad. A question. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We have a moment for questions from the audience. There is a mic uh, that can be passed around. Are there any people that have a question for Vlad? No. Well, I will have a question. I have okay, a question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you say uh, the contemplation of a landscape is vital for uh, mankind and the way we interact with our surroundings. Mm -hmm. um, can you think of that in the way that we are approaching more and more, or this is an actual, or like a, uh, um, well, can you think of it uh, as we are more and more uh, entering a destructive um, uh, relationship towards nature and the and the landscape. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that we are connected, or do you feel that we are sort of alienated? Mm -hmm. I don't think that one perspective excludes the other. So that's uh, that's uh, um, that's something that I would like to uh, under underline. Um, are we in a destructive uh, part of history uh, in, in con concerning our relation to, to nature? Yeah, of course, but we have always been in a way or another. More important thing is the awareness. And the problem that we have nowadays is not so much uh, that we, uh, uh, d that we uh, in use or even abuse nature, but the problem is that um, um, the, mode, the, the mode of thinking that we used to do this, it's, it's already mastering us. That's that kind of rationalization of seeing of seeing the the, the, the planet only as a way of of uh, of uh, uh, energy of, of of exploiting energy is already a mode of thinking that is that is that that occupies us yeah. uh, and our thinking. Yeah. So um, I would not plead neither for a complete kind of uh, uh, Zen Buddhistic mindful <laughs> contemplation of nature. Not, not that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we should be um, in the in the way of contemplate nature. We should realize what kind of thinking is mastering us exactly. well, yeah? Yeah. and what is what we can state as a fact, as a, as a matter of fact, is that uh, that kind of um, 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 management of nature, this kind of rationalistic exploitation of it, is not just something that we do because we need more energy, it's something that we kind of rationally... Exactly. That it's an, it's an irrational idea that masters our lives. Yeah. That's okay. my answer. Thank you, Vlad. Thank okay. you. you Please, have a... Okay. Wiede. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes. Hello. Uh, yeah. The f f I was contemplating landscape. This is what. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. Self-portrait. Uh, as a fragment of a landscape, uh, as a pie chart becomes a pie. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the the earth that is heritage. I like the idea. Uh, you can't touch heritage, of course. Money can touch anything. So yeah. Um, yeah, this fr uh, I like this uh, this painting. It's uh, Friedrich, uh, no, yeah, beautiful. Uh, but yeah, we di we don't see his face, so for for all we know, his eyes are shut. So, <laughs> um, uh, and the, the 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 human hugging tree. It's like the uh, re reverse of the tree hugger. Oh no, the tree <laughs> wants to hug me again. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the the the. the illustration of the landscape that is part of the mind, the mindscape. 
looking at a landscape and the hybrid landscape being so yeah that's that's it thank you thank you so much really